Good morning and welcome to Rising. We've got another great show for you today. I'm joined by Kevin Walling. Nice to see you, Kevin. Morning, Robbie. Good to be with you. Thanks for being in our new digs. How about it? They're beautiful. Thank you. All right, let's get to our top political news story. Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump are hitting the swing states hard just 48 days out from the election. In his first appearance since the apparent assassination attempt on Sunday, Trump spoke to supporters in Flint, Michigan last night alongside his former press secretary, Arkansas Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Governor Sanders did not hold back, took plenty of shots at Harris. Let's watch. So my kids keep me humble. <laughs> Unfortunately, Kamala Harris doesn't have anything keeping her humble. Meanwhile, Vice President Harris spoke in the Philadelphia at the National Association of Black Journalists for her very first solo interview with national media. Take a listen to what she said about the rights Haitian migrant rumors in that speech. I know that people are deeply troubled by what is happening to that community in Springfield, Ohio. And it's got to stop. And we've got to say that you cannot be entrusted with standing behind the seal of the President of the United States of America engaging in that hateful rhetoric that, as usual, is designed to divide us as a country. A new polling has the vice president's uh, standing working in her favor. 538 gives the vice president a 61 percent chance of winning and gives the former president a 39 percent chance of winning. Plus, The Economist polling average finds that Harris has opened up her largest lead yet with over four points uh, over the former president. But not all models paint such a rosy picture. Nate Silver has consistently thought that Trump was somewhat ahead. Silver's model is now back toward 50-50 in the Electoral College. Still, CBS says they're struggling to find any Harris voters at all in Nevada restaurants when they go looking for them. Let's watch this. We had like that. so much fun, but what was really incredible is in every single restaurant of the people willing to talk to us, we could only find one Harris supporter in mm. every restaurant, and we left no stone unturned. I approached every single huh. person. I can't find them. Where are they? I, where are these Harris where were those supporters, supporters hiding that, out? I don't know what restaurants they were going to. I don't know. We, uh, you know, we got to get a note to the Harris campaign to get some more folks out there for buying their own lunches out out uh, out and about. I guess so. This is a 50-50 election right now. It's going to be incredibly close. The last seven weeks to go in this matchup. The last election was also very close, and this is going to be even closer. Um, so you know, it's depending on who's your favorite uh, pollster. I happen to quite like uh, Nate Silver, who has given. Um, a little bit more likelihood to Trump prevailing, I would say, over the last few weeks than um, other models, which he explains pretty thoroughly on his Substack. if you find that. But the major issue for Harris, I mean, it's an issue for both of them, is that it's Pennsylvania. That's right. Very likely to decide the election. And um, Kamala Harris has not had, you know, she has polls there showing her up maybe a point or two. But, you know, we got to go back to how bad the polling error was in the Democrats' favor last time around. You know, if she, polls only showing in both her 16 up... 16 and in 20, Yes, too, so errors. polls only showing her up by one or two points when the errors were somewhere between two and four points last time is actually not good for Harris. You need her... If the errors are the same as they were last time, maybe the polls got dramatically more accurate, that's going to be exactly... The final is going to match the polling, and then, yes, Kamala Harris would win. But if the error is as much as it was in the previous cycles, you would actually Donald Trump is actually up despite looking like he's down in those polls. Yeah, Robbie, it's a good point. And, and some procrastinators have said that now they're overemphasizing Trump's support in some of these polls to make up for that gap that we saw in 2016 and 2020. It's anyone's guess, though, uh, on the ground what that looks like. Of course, the Harris campaign is out there touting all these regional offices that they're opening. I think there's 50 offices now open in must-win Pennsylvania, to your point. Um, and we'll see what kind of operation the RNC and the Trump campaign roll out. But now it's it's certainly on. Again, with less than, than seven weeks uh, uh, left in this race, the vice president is back in Washington giving a speech, uh, speech to the Congressional Hispanic Institute, a must-win block for Democrats. We've seen some of that support kind of falter from Democrats in, in recent uh, polling uh, and in support of Donald Trump. So she's got to re, uh, reassure her base. Of course, former president's in deep blue <laughs> New York on Long Island tonight. 
uh, rallying his base. Uh, people are saying tens of thousands of, of folks are going to show up uh, for that event. Of course, the second one since that assassination attempt uh, in Palm Beach. What I think Trump has done very effectively in recent weeks is talk about economic issues that might specifically apply to voters he's trying to reach, like people who work for tips in restaurants. Talk about not being able to find Kamala Harris supporters in restaurants. He said, okay, no taxing on tips. And it's a good enough idea that the that vice she, president's campaign she had to adapt it. taken hold of that. But <laughs> she ha you know, she's put forth economic plans that... I, I, I mean, I, I don't really think are very good, but ha and have actually not gotten, I would say, a rave reception from economists in terms of the, you know, giving money to people to buy houses. Well, that's not going to do anything for the housing supply. It's just going to raise housing prices. That kind of stuff. You know, what should she be out there? And then, of course, the right has been all about the harms from immigration in small towns. I'm sure we'll, we've talked about that exhaustively this week. I don't even want to open up that can of worms <laughs> oh, or fish or yeah. birds or cats <laughs> yet again. I am getting very sick Sounds of the subject. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but that does speak to the fears that a lot of people, and, you know, not just suburban uh, white voters, but uh, members of, of these uh, communities who also in some cases feel displaced by immigrant labor or, or uh, illegal immigrants taking social service or things of that nature. Yeah, and to your point, uh, Robbie, all eyes on the economy, right? And all eyes certainly on what the Fed is going to do today. I think the vice president's campaign is hoping for at least a, at, at most a, a half point uh, reduction uh, in interest rates. That would hopefully fuel uh, the economy uh, heading into the, this final stretch. Um, but certainly, the pocketbook issues are, uh, are front and center. And to your point, the former president has been, I think, effectively communicating on that front. Uh, we saw that last night with uh, Governor Sanders uh, in Michigan. Uh, and we'll see uh, how the vice president can step up and counter some of those economic attacks. Hopefully, that rate cut will help uh, her campaign fuel that effort. Yeah, I mean, it's always important to remember that she just kind of got, you know, foisted into this role as the candidate. Um, she did not have to run a primary campaign. She did not have to do debates. So, you know, whether her message, her policies, her character resonates with the American people has been, I mean, it's obviously been tested to some degree. She yeah. was on the winning ticket we, last time. And but. to your point, we've seen her favorability increase, interestingly yeah. enough. She was, she was somewhat underwater as vice president the days before the president decided to step back. I think she was like 16 points underwater. Now she's near even in terms of favorability. That jump has been extraordinary. We'll see if that's sustainable with that kind of honeymoon that continues on uh, over these next seven weeks. She's benefited from what I would say is just incredibly favorable, positive media coverage, gush gushing, uh, I might even say sycophantic at times, <laughs> and that has helped her. I, I would say she's doing just about as well as could have been expected given that this was kind of a risky move. Well, I mean, it wasn't a risky move to change candidates because Joe Biden was going to lose yeah, the election. We were headed it was to, almost yeah. guaranteed. Yes, so yep. at that point, doing anything is actually not risky. Keeping Biden was risky. But, uh, you know, as you pointed out, she had a low favorability rating. Mm -hmm. For most of his presidency, she was less popular than he was. Through, People found her the last three and a half years. as yep. a less, uh, less effective communicator specifically than him uh, up until the very end. Um, so she's doing well, given all that. She's made this a very, very, very close election. And something exciting to watch, too. And something exciting to watch. That, that's all we Which care we'll about as the pundits. That's day all in we and day out. About. Absolutely. All right, we'll have more rising right after this. Lots more of the show to come. Could have been something out of a John Le Carré novel, but this horror is all very real. Clandestine group turned to old school beepers, those devices used by doctors and others before the advent of cell phones, to safely, they thought, communicate. But somehow, the other side infiltrated these devices during their manufacturing halfway across the world. And then on a well-planned day, hundreds of beepers sent a false message from what they believed was leadership. And when these hundreds of members went to read the messages, they exploded. Yes, hundreds of beepers did explode across Lebanon simultaneously. The result was thousands of being injured, including many innocent civilians who just happened to be standing nearby. The most recent casualty count is at 12, but expected to go higher, perhaps significantly higher. Hands were blown off, faces were mangled, sirens and chaos. That was Lebanon yesterday, the target being Hezbollah. According to news reports, Israel has confided in its ally Washington that it was work. It was their actual handiwork. No one doubts that as Israel's intel progress and execution is legendary, but now as the dust settles, many wonder if this really will be the beginning of a wider war in the region. 
Let's remember Israel and Hamas have been at war for almost a year now. There have been missiles fired between Hezbollah in Lebanon and Israel in the last few months. The Houthis in Yemen have also been active. So here to further explain what this latest attack means uh, is Professor Trita Parsi, Executive Vice President of the Quincy Institute of Statecraft. Dr. Parsi, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I wonder if you could take us into some of the conversations that are likely happening in uh, Beirut right now as a result. Of course, uh, Iran's um, uh, ambassador to Beirut was uh, harmed in this attack. Uh, I think we're reading and hearing more about uh, his injuries being very significant. But what do, what do you think is the, going to be the response in the short term uh, coming from Beirut? So if you take a look at this over the course of the last 11 months, the pattern we see is that the overwhelming number of attacks are coming from the Israeli side against Lebanon. Uh, up until about a month ago, the, the, the statistics show that 83% of all of the projectiles being fired were fired from the Israeli side into Lebanon, not the other way around. And this then supports a, another pattern that has also been quite clear, which is that it is not Hezbollah or Iran that is looking for a fight or an expansion of the war. It is on the Israeli side. In fact, the Israeli defense minister just said earlier this week that war with Lebanon is necessary in order to uh, what he called the tranquilize the northern front. And we also have uh, statements from the U.S. government, or at least leaks from the U.S. government, saying that for months they have tried to convince the Israelis not to start another war, not to expand the war into Lebanon. The Lebanese have not responded uh, in the same manner or with the same ferociousness. Uh, and that has been criticized by some on their end as saying that it's not been enough to restore deterrence. And the Iranians have not at all responded in some cases, including the assassination of Ismail Haniya in Tehran on the day of the inauguration of the Iranian president. So the question here at this point is, you know, the Israelis seem to be quite um, intent on expanding this war, really getting into a real war with Lebanon. And the more we're seeing that Hezbollah is, is showing a degree of restraint, not full restraint, but a degree of restraint, it does not seem to lead to a scenario in which the Israelis are backing off. But on the contrary, they're further escalating. And this is in contradiction to what the U.S. is telling the Israelis that it wants Israel to do, which is to not start a war, certainly not right before the elections. Uh, I, I want to step and back. From the U.S. standpoint. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, well, go ahead. Finish your point. Well, I was just going to say, from the U.S. standpoint, obviously, the most important thing here is to not have a regional war that drags the U.S. into it. But unfortunately, that is exactly what the Israelis seem to be intent on doing. And Biden's strategy of preventing that has been an absolutely abysmal failure. Can we talk a little bit more about what actually took place yesterday? You know, these videos all over social media of the pagers um, exploding, injuring, um, you know, not just the people who had them, but people nearby. I mean, can you imagine if this happened while you were driving? That the, the potential to, her, to harm not specifically alleged Hezbollah fighters is, I mean, you know, I'm sure we're going to continue to learn about all the examples of that happening. I mean, this is rather... This is kind of black mirror dystopia, kind of your, your device just exploding um, in your pocket. What do we know about how this, was, this operation was executed? Um, should we, is this going to be a new front just in warfare more generally? Do you have to worry about you know, where, <laughs> what hostile nation your cell phone came from, the, the technology used to do this? I presume my understanding is it wasn't like some hacking of the pager technology, but rather that they had something in them already you, that you can't just technologically, you know, do this to any random device of this kind. But you know, what do we know about how this was done and what it means for the future of warfare? We don't have a full picture, but let me start off by saying this. If some other entity had done this to Israel or to the United States, we would have immediately called it an act of terror and an act of war. Now we're doing neither. But in the eyes of much of the world, that is exactly what this is. Now, when it comes to the detail of exactly what happened, the picture is still not fully clear. But it does appear very likely that these were uh, beepers that the Israelis had interjected on their way to Lebanon in a third country 
injected a specific type of explosive in it, uh, up to 20 grams of it. And this was done about four to five months ago. And then the question is, how exactly did they manage to make them detonate all at the same time? Is it as a result of uh, sending signals to the beepers that overheated the battery and then that caused the explosion to take place? Earlier on, there was some speculation that that was what was done, but without explos explosives being inside the beepers. And as a result, this could be done to any beeper. It does not appear to be the case at this point. The, the structure of the explosions, et cetera, do not seem to suggest that that is a battery exploding and certainly not a battery exploding with this type of ferocity of being able to kill people. Uh, so there seems to have been a combination of the two. But as you pointed out, these, the, the Israelis had no idea where this very large number of beepers were at the time uh, in which the explosions took place. People could be driving. In some cases, they were in hospitals. In some cases, hospital personnel were holding these beepers in hospitals, causing damage inside those hospitals as well. And again, that is precisely why if this had been done to us, there would have been absolutely no hesitation. We would have called this an act of terror because by definition, we do not have any control over the degree to which civilians would have been uh, targeted and harmed in this. Dr. Parsi, I wonder if you could speak to the timing of this attack. I'll note that Secretary of State Blinken is actually in Cairo at this very moment working on uh, a ceasefire deal on behalf of the administration. What, do you th what went into the timing of this specific attack by Israel? I mean, the timing we have seen on many of these other attacks by the Israelis is that they um, either don't care at all what the U.S. is doing in terms of these ceasefire talks that at this point are quite farcical, uh, or that they're actually doing it at a moment in order to sabotage those talks, not that those talks were going anywhere anyways. But I think what is increasingly clear, though, is that there seems to be a desire on the Netanyahu government to expand the war and to expand the war prior to the U.S. election. This would have the benefit for Netanyahu's perspective of most likely helping Trump get elected. That seems to be the calculation, whether that's true or not. It would force both Trump and um, Harris to take on this knee-jerk pro-Israel uh, position, even though what Israel is doing is completely undermining U.S. interests. And then by the time either Harris or Trump, uh, or, uh, uh, Trump go gets into office, the war is already a reality. Uh, and as a result, the U.S. Is maneuverability in the region will be even less, and there is little that they can do about it. Again, none of this would have happened, in my view, had it not been for the Biden administration adopting this so-called beer hog strategy with Israel in the first place. This idea that the best way to exert leverage and gain leverage over Israel in order to be able to restrain it is to actually support it to the tilt defend it and protect it at the U.N., make excuses for it when it is assassinating American citizens, and that that some way, somehow, miraculously would cause the Israelis to listen more to the United States. It's been completely the opposite, predictably. There's absolutely no reason to believe that that strategy would have worked in the first place. And instead, what we have seen is that the more the Biden administration has done this, the more they have protected Israel, made excuses for Israel, armed Israel to the tilt, the more Israel has become dismissive of American wishes. And lastly, how would you respond to an argument I saw on social media from supporters of Israel um, saying that, well, their state of war exists between Israel and Hezbollah. This was, a, it's not a surprise that they're enemy groups, um, that Hezbollah is a terrorist group. And so this was a legitimate um, attack on their operating capabilities. Well, first of all, even if one were to accept the argument that a war is already existing between Israel and, and Hezbollah, reality is that this was a significant escalatory move that would bring the war into, very likely bring it into a much higher level. And again, I'm speaking from a U.S. national interest perspective, that's exactly what we want to avoid, because if this war escalates further, then it risks dragging the United States into it. And the absolute last thing we need is another war in the Middle East that the U.S. is involved in, particularly one that absolutely serves none of our interests. Secondly, even if the Israelis were to make the argument that they're targeting Hezbollah and they view it as a terrorist organization, et cetera, et cetera, this was not a targeted attack. 
This was something that, as you mentioned, could happen when they're driving a car causing massive uh, car accidents. At the end of the day, we have about 4,000 people injured, 300 critically at the hospitals. Not all of them in any way, shape, or form were Hezbollah operatives. And again, had Hezbollah or any other entity done it to Israel or to the United States, we would not have hesitated. We would have called it an act of war, and we would have called it an act of terrorism. Hmm. Trita Parsi, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Members of Congress are sidestepping House ethics rules. Not shocking. Not to depart them from using public funds, your money, by the way, for campaign purposes. A new report from independent journalist Lee Fong reveals that lawmakers are airing so-called constituent ads, basically advertisements that mirror campaign ads, in their bids to get reelected. Here are a few of those ads from both Republicans and Democrats. Take a look. Congressman David Valadeo is delivering real results for the Central Valley. He's doing this by bringing 55 million in taxpayer dollars back to our community for local water projects, infrastructure improvements, and law enforcement. As a result, Valley families will enjoy safer communities, cleaner drinking water, and less congested traffic. Congressman David Valadeo is working hard to deliver real results for Central Valley families. Tom worked across party lines to help convince the president to issue a tougher executive order to secure the border. Named to the Homeland Security Committee and chair of the Border Security Task Force, now Tom Swazi is again working across party lines to build a bipartisan national coalition to secure the border, fix the broken asylum system, and modernize immigration laws. Sfong writes, what was once a rare ethics violation now seems ultra common with both parties. For his latest Substack posts, Fong dug deep into congressional spending accounts normally reserved for district tr travel, spa staff payroll, and other official-related incidental expenses, and found lawmakers are running for re-election on taxpayers' dollars. Here to elaborate on how these members of Congress are going around House rules is Lee Fong. Welcome back, Lee. Good to have you. Hey, good to see you guys. Thanks for having me. So I love the investigation and the post that, that you wrote. One of the ones that stood out to me the most was uh, Congressman Thandar uh, in uh, Michigan, who's, I, I think, spent almost half a million dollars on billboards uh, with his face around his district uh, in Michigan. I wonder if you could talk about some of your uh, uh, favorites that you've found in terms of some of the most egregious uh, members, uh, both Republicans and Democrats, abusing this privilege. Well, that's right. Uh, Congressman uh, Sri Thanadar in Michigan was facing a tough primary challenge this year. And around the time of his primary challenge in the Democratic primary, uh, he started plastering his district with government funded billboards with his face, uh, looked a lot like any kind of typical campaign ad. And he also produced several um, constituent advertisements that, again, looked virtually identical to a campaign ad. Um, that were aired uh, online and on television. That funding, um, that half a million dollars, just over a, a three-month period that he spent on these ads using uh, his taxpayer expense account, that was more than three times the amount he spent on staff. Now, these uh, met what are known as member representational allowances are supposed to be used strictly for official nonpartisan purposes, uh, the paying of staff, of travel back and forth between the district, reimbursements for some meals and, and research services, you know, when members are writing bills or answering constituent mail, uh, there are strict limits on preventing members from enriching themselves or using this for partisan or political purposes. We've seen that criminal indictments in the past, uh, people like Aaron Schock uh, were criminally in indicted uh, long ago, over a decade ago. Uh, for abusing these expense accounts. And we've seen some scandals here and there in history of members kind of skirting the line with political communications using their expense accounts. You know, maybe a, a Republican saying, taking a poll of their constituents of how they feel about Obamacare or Democrats taking a poll of their district, how they feel about abortion rights, you know, these kind of hot button issues. But this is really the very first time we've seen widespread abuse of these expense accounts to run essentially campaign advertisements for re-election by many members of Congress. You know, I, I looked at over 80 members, found about a dozen airing <clears throat> essentially campaign ads. Uh, it's likely a much higher amount if you look at all 435. Hmm. Is it because, I don't know, it's kind of murky or debatable or questionable whether these are, you know, legitimate um, 
services being provided. I mean, I obviously understand why you say that this is for you know their own reelection or own campaign purposes, but can they plausibly position it as some legitimate expense? Or you know, what is the is the law very clear cut? Um, and and what are the what are the penalties supposed to be? Well, look, um, there can be a ethics investigation of, of abuse of these expense accounts. We've seen a, a Florida Democrat last year. Uh, a, House Ethics Committee opened an investigation uh, into, into her uh, reportedly around abuse of this uh, type of funds. But just generally speaking, it's not clear. You know, Congress has the intent of uh, actually expanding the use of these communication purposes of these uh, expense accounts. In the end of the last Congress, in the end of 2022, members, and it's not clear who, but members potentially uh, of leadership. Uh, slipped in a provision actually extending the time that these uh, expense account funded communications can be spent. Previously, it was the limit was up to 90 days before an election. So, you know, August 7th was supposed to be the cutoff for these communications, you know, knowing very well that any kind of communication from a member of Congress right before election can appear as a form of electioneering. Uh, they changed the timeline now members can communicate with constituents using these expense accounts uh, up to uh, 60 days before election, or you know, it was about like I, I think September 9th was the cutoff. But you know, th maybe the issue with enforcement here is uh, the subjectivity that you know one one member can argue is uh, simply a public policy message. Another uh, person of the public could say that hey, this is a campaign ad. Um, it's perhaps difficult to argue in court. But I think if any ordinary person, any journalist, anyone who's worked in politics just watches these ads, they look identical to campaign ads. Not only that, these members are hiring their campaign consulting firms to produce these ads. They're using their taxpayer expense accounts to hire their own political consultants that are also working for super PACs and their, and their political campaigns to double as their constituent communication manager making these uh, television and online advertisements. Lee, take us into the process, if you would, of how these ads get approved. And it's not just digital ads or billboards that we've talked about, but it's also newsletters from the members' offices, uh, digital ads, social media posts. There's a house franking office, I'm sure, but what is the process and, and, uh, and who enforces uh, these decisions? Well, um, there are, there's a house administration, house ethics process. Um, you know, a, a copy of these ads need to be submitted for approval. There's a letter that has to be submitted by members. Um, but, I, you know, I believe that's the extent of it. There really hasn't been much reporting on this. Um, a few local news outlets have noted the unusual uptick in these ads. Um, Brandon Williams, a House Republican who, who's kind of facing a tough re-election, uh, local New York uh, media noted this. The Thanadar uh, uh, billboards have been noted because they're, they're so unusual by Detroit media. But again, I, I found so many more examples. Th th those, those, most of these examples that I found have not been reported by any media, local or national. So there hasn't been much public pushback on how this money is spent. Um, again, I've, I've seen controversies in the past that simple constituent town halls and, and uh, you know, polls might skirt the line. But these ads, I mean, some of them are so highly produced, they look like a typical super PAC ad. I, I would challenge anyone to kind of uh, decipher the difference between this and a traditional campaign ad. You know, I remember you brought up Aaron Schock earlier. I remember, you know, that was a big, funny news story because he had like redecorated his congressional office to look like Downton Abbey. And it was a funny story that got a lot of attention. Have we just, in these, I don't know, insane times, are the American people not as much capable of being shocked by corrupt or bad behavior from our congressman. I mean, you have, you know, Menendez had like gold bars in his, I don't know, wardrobe closet or something. You have, I mean, not, and not, I'm not making this partisan at all. You have, you know, members of both sides wanting to thwart um, uh, bans on congressional stock trading, for instance. Um, is it that the people just now expect such unethical behavior from their representatives that is, there's not as much um, interest in the media to even cover uh, unless it's, tr you know, transformatively sensational or something like that? Yeah, I, I think you're, you're, you're touching on something here because there's a reason that Congress is, has such low approval ratings. There's a lot of 
do as I say, not as I do. Big exemptions and hypocrisy that you know members will decry government health care, but there's a special office within Congress that provides free government health care to members of Congress. It's the office of a, of attending physician. Uh, you know they've exempted themselves from all the labor rules that they provide for private businesses. So you know uh, members of Congress, their staff, it's difficult for them to form unions or you know they don't have the same kind of hourly and overtime rules. They've exempted themselves from Freedom of Information Act laws. You know they supposedly have insider trading rules, but you know those rules are never really applied to themselves. Um, th there's just a kind of astounding hypocrisy. And here's just kind of just a, a, another example. So I you know I think people in normal people uh, kind of see this and it just entrenches their opinion. But, you know, Congress is um, highly entrenched in terms of incumbency advantage, uh, gerrymandering. It's very difficult to get these members out, even though uh, there might be a lot of anger on both the left and right or the center. Um, this is kind of a nightmare version of public campaign financing. You know, I, I, there are many people who are open to this idea that the government should kind of provide some assistance with uh, campaigning so that members are not so reliant on uh, billionaires or special interests. But this this type of uh, dynamic that I'm kind of revealing in this report, this is only available to incumbents. Uh, challengers and ordinary Americans have no access to this. So if you're running for Congress and hoping to unseat a corrupt or you know incompetent member of Congress, they've got the ability to tap the public purse to use government money to run ads and you don't you know so that that's really the issue here it's mm, a very good point lee fong thank you so much for joining us hey thank you for having me former president donald trump praised the secret service for thwarting an apparent second attempt on his life in a phone call to fox news's sean hannity on tuesday night he had this to say let's listen in this particular case, you had a very sharp agent, as good as you could find, and did a fantastic job. But somebody could have missed the barrel of that rifle. Uh, somebody of lesser talents or somebody that was distracted could have missed or could have been shot. I mean, frankly, you know, could have also been shot. But uh, in this case, it was something that worked out very well. On his golf course at Trump International in West Palm Beach, when he heard shots ring out and the Secret Service escorted Trump off the premises very quickly, Trump also praised the Secret Service in the wake of the Butler, Pennsylvania assassination attempt, of course, though that incident did end up prompting some criticisms of the agency's practices, given that roof was not secure. Now, tensions are escalating between the Trump team and the Secret Service, no matter what Trump says. The Secret Service is demanding more warning. Of for Trump's golf outings so that tighter security can be provided. And Republicans are blaming Democrats' rhetoric for the assassination attempts. Trump running mate J.D. Vance blasted Democrats during his speech at the Georgia Faith and Freedom Coalition dinner. Let's watch. We have a, we have a both sides problem. And I'm not going to say we're always perfect. I'm not going to say that conservatives always get things exactly right. But you know the big difference between conservatives and liberals is that we ha no one has tried to kill Kamala Harris in the last couple of months, and two people now have tried to kill Donald Trump in the last couple of months. I'd say that's pretty strong evidence that the left needs to tone down the rhetoric and needs to cut this crap out. Somebody's going to get hurt by it. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer pushed back on the notion that Democrats' rhetoric is fueling tension. Here he is in a presser on Tuesday. The bottom line is that our Democratic Senate has drawn very clearly the differences between the Republican Party, Donald Trump, and what we believe in. We're going to continue to do that. Asked if Congress will appropriate more funding for the Secret Service, he said that he would be open to that. Now, I am not someone who is a fan of rewarding government <laughs> incompetence with more funding. Um, the government already gets a lot of our money. Us hardworking libertarian, libertarian core, I understand that. Yes, certainly. us hardworking taxpayers pay a whole lot for a lot of things. But maybe we could reallocate some funding from I don't know what are what are some agencies that I would <laughs> shrink their budgets a little bit. Maybe the IRS, maybe the CDC, maybe the State Department. Um, you know, all those kinds of things to make sure the former president gets whatever security he needs to be kept safe, because this is now two assassination attempts in as many months. Um, I, I, I'm 
glad that Kamala Harris hasn't faced any assassination attempts. Yeah, um, let's yeah, hope it remains yeah. that way. But the the local sheriff said on TV that well we're you know Trump's not the per current president he's the former president so the security isn't as robust. I'm like well really they they tried to assassinate him they just tried again again they being too lone as far as we know, yeah. whack job type people. Uh, um, although this individual has a more interesting uh, or backstory, clearly defined certainly. political yeah. backstory, involvement with Ukrainian uh, mercenary efforts. Um, I, I think there certainly should be an investigation to find out whether he has any, um, has had conversations, not, again, not ties, not he, that he was told to do it or something, but whether he has communicated in the past with, um, with national security, with intelligence officials, given that he was overseas well, trying to drum up support for the Ukrainian cause. Yeah, Robbie, not even that, but he also spent a good amount of time on Capitol Hill, too, in interacting with a number of members of Congress, yeah. Republicans and Democrats. They all regarded him as, to your to quote you, as a whack job as part of that, but certainly uh, there's more questions than answers uh, at this point uh, in the process. I hope that, you know, obviously we have the must-pass funding bill on the 30th. You've got some cooler heads um, uh, in the House and the Senate when it comes to appropriations and uh, Homeland Security. I'm thinking, you know, Senator Susan, Susan Collins on the, on the Republican side, uh, others, Tom Carper from Delaware uh, leading uh, that committee. Uh, so hopefully, I think they will get to the bottom of this, allocate emergency resources in the short term. Again, we've got seven weeks to go and then beyond that. But certainly there's a lot of uh, taxes on, uh, on the uh, capabilities of the Secret Service in these final critical seven months, seven weeks. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I guess I'm I'm not surprised to to learn. I'm sad to learn that it's maybe not the most well-run um, aspect of the federal government. It's very important to keep our candidates safe, our top political figures, people for whom there's a likelihood that there would be some threat. Um, I don't think the the failings here were as uh, shocking and front of center as they were in Butler, Pennsylvania, Certainly where there's agreed. just absolutely yeah. no excuse for not having that roof secured, not counting that roof as within the perimeter. You remember they tried to say, well, that was outside the perimeter. We couldn't have had someone on it because it was a sloped roof. That's what the Secret Service director said before resigning. Well, but you had Secret Service on, a, on another sloped roof. The people that shot and killed him quite effectively were on a, were on a sloped roof. Yeah. And, you were it was it was not a difficult shot from where he was positioned and so that should have probably been within the perimeter so that was totally unsatisfactory here this is a golf course wide open massive property certainly. um massive property um bushes trees uh ability but, to hide although he was there for 12 hours i was going to say he was there for 12 hours and they could see the on the cell phone, phone. yeah um, and the fact that that perimeter wasn't secure uh, and to your point I, you know i've been heartened that we have seen bipartisan outrage uh, and condemnation uh, with this uh, uh, committee that's come together to investigate uh, the Butler attack, uh, to your point. Um, and, and hopefully, the, you know, I, we always have these debates over rhetoric and stuff like that. I think a, a lot of this so much is wrapped around people with serious issues, uh, these lone wolves that take it upon themselves to attack public officials. We've seen it against Republicans and Democrats. It's not a both sides well, issue. Um, but I, I am heartened that we are hopefully getting more answers that will better prepare the Secret Service to tackle these issues. Let's going. talk about rhetoric a little bit because both sides very opportunistically when there's violence and you can you know, tangibly trace, discover the ideology of the person, say the other side caused this because of their, their rhetoric. This is something Democrats have done to Republicans, media figures have done to Republicans for years and years and years. Right now, in the last two months, the shoe is on the other foot. And J.D. Vance and Donald Trump are both saying the, the really strong anti-Trump statements that Kamala Harris and Joe Biden have made are inspiring. That You know, if you say he's Hitler, if you say he's a threat to democracy, if you say he's going to be a dictator, does that not embolden people to want to take um, stronger action? I don't think it's correct to blame rhetoric. But at the same time, but still, I mean, there are even some Democrats and media figures saying Trump's own rhetoric is, is causing the attacks and he needs to, it, it seems like a very fraught project. Yeah, it certainly does. And I mean, d democracy in its very nature is messy, right? And you campaign hard, right? And sometimes does the language maybe go a step too far, potentially. But again, I think I, I come back to the fact that so many of these lone wolf actors are, uh, are listening to their own voices in their own heads to dictate a lot of this stuff and aren't you know, laying at the at the feet of uh, you know a, a member of Congress or in this case a presidential candidate. Mm. All right, we'll be back with more rising right after this. 
We are less than two months out from the 2024 presidential election. A new poll shows the majority of Americans support the mass deportation of undocumented immigrants. According to the Scripps Ipsos survey, 54% of respondents said that they strongly or somewhat support this, including 86% of Republicans, 58% of independents, and 25% of Democrats. 39% of people called immigration a top issue for them in this campaign, second only to inflation, which topped the list at 57%. Trump leads on the issue, at least according to this poll. 44% of respondents believe Trump will have a better handle on immigration as opposed to 34% who say that Kamala Harris would. So this is clearly a winning issue for Republicans. This Certainly. is what they want the entire campaign to be about. Americans are very dissatisfied with the situation at the border, with immigration more generally. Um, you saw those numbers. Obviously, Republicans like the way Trump handles it. Democrats don't. But that independence number is so key. 55% of independence is massive. That's what's going to decide the election. So, of course, Republicans want to talk about that. You know, mass deportation, I, I always wonder about these survey questions because how much information do they give people about what that would actually look like? Does it say, like, are you willing to spend, you know, $13 billion of public of dollars to go door to door? Right, do kind know, of, yeah. you know, 1984 mm -hmm. level surveillance of people. Um, I think most people are going to say, actually, no. But what people will say is that why is there not better screening and processing so that we only have people coming to the country who want to work here and don't have criminal backgrounds? Why are people streaming across? you know, the, uh, the, the Rio Grande in, in Texas and causing chaos in border towns. Um, why isn't it done in a way that better fits the needs of the American people? And, and those are answers that Democrats have not done a good enough job of supplying. Obviously, like the asylum process is flooded right now because that's the easiest way to legally sure. migrate is yeah. to claim asylum status and then, sit, and then be in the country and wait for a hearing, you know, that could be years away. Meanwhile, people who are trying to do it the right way, who are trying okay, years to, are years. waiting yeah. years. Qualif people who, who employers want to hire to do work, to contribute to our country, they're waiting in line for years because the process is so Byzantine and bureaucratic. So it is a huge mess. Um, I, I'm too cynical. I actually don't have a lot of faith that either Trump or Harris or anyone will uh, will make the kinds of improvements we need so that we can have more more simpler, better, faster, Stream efficient, exactly. legal immigration, and then also have border security so that we can vet and we know who's coming in here. That's what everybody wants, right? That's the, that's what people Absolutely. want. And, and to your point, I think this issue, more than most, lends itself to optics, right? And we know in politics, optics are everything. You talk about the streaming of folks across that border. That's on a lot of different news channels 24-7, right? And obviously, we see that in the polling that this is the second most important issue besides the economy. One of the interesting numbers in that Ipsos uh, poll, and you mentioned that the, uh, the independent number at 55%, 25% of Democrats in that same poll <laughs> right, that's would not support... Nothing. Uh, a mass deportation. And I think we're going to see, you know, the vice president speak about that today before the Congressional Hispanic Institute. She uh, gives those remarks uh, this afternoon. Um, but certainly this is going to be an issue uh, at play over these next uh, seven weeks. Yeah. And I also think, uh, I, I think Republicans have miscalculated on immigration a little bit over the years. Just assuming they, they thought it of it as like a, like a political threat because Immigrants are going to come in and they're going to vote Democrat and we'll never win again. The whole demographics or destiny idea that actually I think many Democratic pundits or activists or camp people seized upon like, ha ha, we're going to win <laughs> forever in the future. But as it turns out, a lot of Hispanic immigrants are yeah. conservative, are religious, uh, hate socialism, uh, et cetera. Trump is doing better and better, at, at least in terms of the history of the Republican Party, with many immigrant groups, minority groups, um, et cetera. It, Kamala Harris, the Democrats don't have the, are, are not benefiting from like automatic loyalty of any of these groups. And so, you know, she could lose the election on that basis. And to your point, I think that's the danger in painting a community like that with one broad brush, right? We, we think it as, as a monolithic group, Hispanic Americans, but they come from different countries, right? We talk about the, for example, Cuban Americans uh, in Florida, which have fueled Republican politics for generations. Um, and I think we get into a lot of pro politicians of all stripes get into, into uh, problems when they try and paint uh, a particular group with a broad brush. 
especially with the issue of, of uh, abortion, right, which is mm -hmm. a critical issue for a lot of Catholic Hispanics in this country. A lot of these uh, individuals are also small business owners, right? So they're focusing on economic issues, and we think, you know, their top issue might be immigration. But it's actually, you know, they've been here for generations, and they care about the state of the economy and being a small business owner. So I think a tailored message to these groups is going to be critical for both Donald Trump and Kamala Harris that, to your point, the former president are making some serious inroads with uh, across uh, some of these key battleground states. Sometimes you even hear it from just from illegal immigrants when they're recording them at the border or you know people reporters who go down there talk to them they'll say well yeah I, I want to get in this country but you should shut it behind me yeah, I don't, right. I don't let yeah, anybody pull that ladder back up. Yeah. that's a common yeah. I mean it's just a common attitude generally because we're all descended most of us from some Im immigrant group that came to this country exactly right yeah, yeah. so it's uh, it, it's going to continue to be I think the defining issue um, of this campaign obviously Democrats have been trying to emphasize that like well we had this great immigration border security bill and Republicans killed it because they thought that would be a win for us and Republicans have tried to say well it was a bad bill and no you gotta put us back in charge and then we'll do maybe we'll do the same exact one but <laughs> but uh, we we have to oversee it that that you know Biden doesn't need this bill to you know get what needs to be done at the border I mean we haven't even heard from or seen Biden who knows what he's working on or doing these days I do we do we even have a president right now? Is it okay to ask that? I mean, his visibility has dropped to nothing, yeah. which is I certainly think, the very focus concerning, has been off. is it and, not? Yeah, and certainly the focus has been off of him, uh, at least in the last you know, eight weeks or so since his campaign, I, or, well, four weeks. I wonder if they think that if they even put him in front of a camera again for like five seconds, there's going to be a, the cabinet's going to invoke whichever <laughs> artic yeah, yeah, yeah. article 25 because it will just be so apparent to the American people that he is... I mean, he's going to limp over the finish line of this term. I mean, you, I, I hate to say that. You, it's, it's, it's not, it's not kind to be, you know, beating up on an elderly person, but he yeah. just way I past saw, his capability. I saw him last week at the White House for the Gamecocks there, yeah. uh, in the East Room, and he was cracking jokes, and he was all uh, right. Well, full of life, and then he hosted uh, the Connecticut Huskies uh, in the afternoon. So at least last week he was firing on all cylinders. Oh, I haven't seen him go. this week though. There you go. <laughs> Um, immigration has been very much back in the news recently, specifically with all these conversations. Let's just talk about it briefly, mm -hmm. and then maybe this will be the last time with the, the pets. I guarantee you won't. The pets <laughs> eating stuff, which, again, which got, you know, the wrong things got emphasized and, and exaggerated because there actually aren't um, accusations of pets specifically being abducted and eaten. But there does seem to be at least some dissatisfaction in small towns like Springfield, Ohio, with the massive influx of immigrants and other problems that might be creating. Well, certainly, and Is it's that fair a, to say. Certainly, yeah, I I would agree, and it's certainly a capacity issue for a lot of these small towns that have borne the burden of these different populations coming in and taxing local resources and things like that. Now, a lot of folks in Springfield, including the local leadership, has have praised roundly a lot of these Haitian immigrants who are here legally because of protected status. And, and we're working. And, and because working, of that can work. Working. That's the, I, I think many That's people the difference, don't like the idea of uh, immigrants, um, you know, taking away from Just the public services, into, yeah. taking welfare, and and I don't either. But yeah. if it can be, you know, it, they should have to work, and this group is working, and that was important to the small towns uh, revitalization, but you know, also exactly bringing right. in more people strains the school system and the healthcare system unless you, you know, allocate your resources differently. Yeah, we're in agreement on that. Part. More rising right after this. Instagram is cracking down. The social media app is making teen accounts private by default in an effort to make the platform safer for children. The new move comes amid a growing backlash, bipartisan backlash, against how social media affects kids' mental health. Now, Meta acknowledged that teens may lie about their age and says it will require them to verify their ages in more instances. The social media giant also said that they're building tech that's capable of finding teen accounts that pretend to be adult accounts. Private messages will also be restricted on teen accounts so that they can only be received from accounts they're already connected to. Plus, sensitive content will be limited, and teens will be notified if they're on the app for more than 60 minutes with a sleep mode automatically enabled from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Now, 16 and 17-year-olds will be able to turn these settings off, but if you're under 16, you'll need your parents' permission to do so. Of course, Meta faces lawsuits from dozens of U.S. states that accuse the company of harming young people and contributing to the youth mental health crisis by knowingly designing features on their app that addict children to its platforms. 
New York Attorney General Letitia James's office is working with other New York officials to implement a state law that would curb children's access to social media feeds. James writing on uh, X, quote, we know that social media is hurting our kids and that's why we led the charge to protect our kids on social media platforms. This is an important first step, but much more needs to be done to ensure our kids are protected from the harms of social media. Republican Senator Marsha Blackburn, who is pushing the House to pass the Kids Online Safety Act, wrote on X, quote, from exposing kids to drugs, explicit material, traffickers, and more, social media platforms are pushing harmful content onto our children. The Kids Online Safety Act would require social media companies to enable the strongest privacy settings for children by default and to disable algorithms that show addictive products among other provisions. But many supporters of free speech and civil liberties oppose this bill. Republican Senator Rand Paul wrote that CASA would impose an unprecedented duty of care on internet platforms to design their sites to mitigate and prevent harms associated with mental health such as anxiety, depression, and eating disorders. This requirement will not only stifle free speech, but it will deprive Americans of the benefits of our technological advancements. And frankly, Instagram willingly implementing these kinds of uh, features that many parents want is, I would actually take it as an example of just the company solving its own problems without um, legislation coming in and trying to rework how the platform functions in ways that could potentially harm everybody's free speech. Because again, if you have a, if you have a federal policy that requires what the Kids Online Safety Act is going to require. Well, it's not just, there's no way to just require kids to have to verify their ages. That's saying everybody's going to have to, Certainly. Going to, have to do it. And is that constitutional? Is that consistent with the First Amendment? I don't know. We'll have to find out one day before the Supreme Court. I would bet not, because the Supreme Court famously said that you couldn't have a state law in California restricting the sale of violent video games to minors because they thought the harm arguments were BS and that it was a free speech violation. I don't see how this is going to be any different. You know, she says, Letitia James and Marsha Blackburn, that... It's, Very interesting bedfellows, uh, Letitia James. Yeah, there's James a lot of bedfellows. And Marsha Blackburn together uh, right, yeah. on this issue. At some of these hearings, enough. when they haul the tech leaders before Congress and scream at them, it's, yeah, it's Democrats and Republicans doing it with like lone, wacko libertarian people that I like, like Rand Paul saying, uh, really? This because, is role. Yeah. because um, you know, there are certainly some harms. I'm not saying social media is good for everyone in all cases, definitely cases where it has harmed young people, but, you know, we did the casual assertion that. This is, we've just determined that this product is bad for young people in the same way that like smoking is bad for young people or something. It's, it's not, the science on that is not settled to that degree at all. Some young people are using social media. They're using it right now to watch, to watch my television show, which I hope educates them about the state of the world, right? It, it would be very silly for me to say that social media is universally harmful. It makes me suspicious a lot of times. Well, who's saying that and what do they want what sources of information are they trying to protect you from that they want to turn off or limit your access to a way to get information that is outside and beyond their control? Of course, they seek more control over it. It makes me very suspicious and very reticent to sign on to any of these broad federal efforts to put more control over the content on the Internet into, I understand why we don't trust many of the tech moderators, the people who run the companies, sure. but it's transferring their authority, which, fine, be skeptical of their authority, but it's transferring that authority to Congress, uh, in whose authority I'm infinitely more skeptical of. Well, certainly, and to your point, I think you're seeing this action taken by Instagram after years of review uh, and conversations with parents and I'm, I'm certain mental health professionals about uh, taking these actions without government uh, forcing this on them. They're being good, uh, you know, corporate citizens responding to a problem that a lot of youths have in terms of issues with social media and, and loneliness. But I think this, is, this speaks to a larger issue with young people writ large uh, in this country. Uh, coming out of COVID, and we've had conversations about uh, some of the, the, the really terrible issues coming out of COVID in terms of mental health with young people, uh, loneliness among young people, and that social media sometimes aggrandizes some of those uh, issues that kids are, are feeling. But certainly I, I, I'm hopeful that corporate actors taking this upon themselves to address the situation with uh, young people and with parents at the table is the right step as opposed to a government intervention, right, that's yeah, going to be absolutely. blanketed across all these different tech companies, certainly. Well, parents, parents want these features and, you know, more choice and control and customization coming from the 
platforms from the companies themselves is always going to be beneficial so that parents can make have more tools to make the right decisions for their families. Of course I agree that, I mean, it just, it's, it's the natural state of affairs that underage kids need, should need, have to have their parents' permission or buy-in and can only, should only be able to participate on the social media site to the extent parents and families think it's a good idea. The, yeah. the reasonable limits should be set by families. But that's and really every kid how is it different, is. And every parent and is every, different, absolutely, right? And blanket yes, rules. 100%. Right? Some kids it may be better off with no social media. Some would be better off with some limited amount. Um, some kids would be more miserable if you suddenly took away their entire access to mm -hmm. to to their phones, to their friends, to to content. Um, this is a it's a creative and expressive enterprise for a lot of people. So I wouldn't, by law, suddenly shut down their access because also it's substituting the judgment of families for the judgment of Congress. Because right now, the default is families have, now they should have more resources to make it easier for families to set what the limitations are. But I don't want to take that power out of parents' hands, which is what some of these legislations would do because Certainly. they would say that, well, no, you have to be, you have to show ID or you have to be a certain age or it's whatever Congress determines rather than what individual families determine. And that's not, I don't want, I don't want the government to be your parent either. And interestingly enough, I mean, COSA was one of the few, I mean, we have a very divided Congress, right? I know, 91 I votes. That, that, that doesn't uh, mean it's a good that, idea. Exactly right, exactly right. But this was one of the few things that has actually passed the Congress. Obviously, it's uh, going to come up, I'm, I'm sure, uh, for a final passage. Um, but it is interesting that this is one of the few things uh, that Congress has actually been able to act on, right? We, we haven't started uh, funding the government just yet, but the, you know, in these divided times that we've seen, this kind of bipartisan support is interesting. And to our original point, interesting bedfellows across, across uh, party yes. lines. I, uh, I'm not someone who wants more bipartisanship. I start to get a little... <laughs> skeptical and like, oh, so they agree that there should maybe be a government commission that decides if there's too much bad or harmful content on social media. Hmm, is that going to be the best thing for the American people? I worry it will not be. And also, I, again, I, I do suspect whenever, someday, there will be a massive Supreme Court ruling oh, on certainly. what the standards will be for social media and for young people and whether it's speech or not. And this court, as currently constituted, is so pro-free speech, so broad on the First Amendment that um, I, I have a hard time imagining them um, saying that, oh yeah, Citing yeah, Congress can decide that you yep. can turn off the access to social media for huge swaths of the population. That's consistent with the First Amendment. I don't see them saying that, but we don't know. And all I know is that Congress has come a long way from those hearings with uh, Mark Zuckerberg and internet tubes and things like that, and you know how oh. Facebook makes its money. Remember that famous not, uh, hearing from not, right, a not, decade ago? I think nothing disabuses the American people of the notion that Congress should have more control over, over social technology. media than watching those hearings where they don't even understand. I mean, our our very very elderly members of Congress asking basic questions internet tubes about it how it works. Yeah. Oh, that was pretty uh, extraordinary. <laughs> not uh, not uh, very knowledgeable people there. We'll be back with more rising right after this. Fifteen months since Ocean Gate's Titan submersible killed all five people on board when it imploded during a dive to see the Titanic. Now the public is finally getting a look at the extent of Titan's and Ocean Gate's problems before the submersible took its final dive. The Coast Guard's Marine Board of Investigation tasked with reviewing the tragedy holding a hearing over the next two weeks to determine the causes and factors that led to the implosion on the first day of testimony. The former lead engineer for the submersible, Tony Neeson, said he 100% felt pressured to get the vessel ready to dive, and he refused to pilot it. Let's watch. Would you have felt comfortable as the director of engineering going down in the Titan submersible, specifically hull one, to full rated depth? That's almost the best question here, isn't it? So. Stockton's and my relationship started to turn sour. Um, as everything was built, but um, he asked me, he wanted me to be the pilot that runs the um, Titanic missions. And I told him I'm not getting in it. And uh, he asked me why, and I said, because the operations crew, I don't trust them. Nissen also noted that the Titan was struck by lightning during a 2018 test mission and thinks that that may have compromised it.
The engineer said he was eventually fired after refusing to let the submersible journey to the Titanic in 2019. More tests and more adjustments were done before the Titan's subsequent dives. Meanwhile, the Coast Guard representatives testified that the submersible was left exposed to the elements while in storage for seven months in 2022 and 2023. Investigators also revealed the ship had 70 equipment issues in 2021 and 48 issues later that year in 2022. And that's not all. The former director of marine operations said that during a journey with Rush in 2016, he, quote, embarrassed Rush by telling him he shouldn't pilot the vessel. Rush refused and went on to smash into a wreck with three passengers on board. One of the final messages that Rush sent from the Titan said, quote, all good here. Following the hearing, the Marine Board of Investigation will create a public report, which could include making referrals to relevant authorities for prosecution. So we are adjudicating exactly what went wrong in this famous, infamous implosion, which killed a number of people who were on board to see the Titanic. Um, it certainly sounds like a tremendous amount of negligence <laughs> and, uh, and forewarning that things were not all good, that they were pressed to go ahead with this, even though it wasn't ready, although they'd had years to make it ready. It's just inherently dangerous getting down to that depth um, in, a, in a confined, pressurized, I would not do it. I have Absolutely to, not, oh me either. Oh my God, no. <laughs> it, it's easier to get to the moon than it is to get to the bottom of the ocean um, to, you know, to go, <laughs> to go, what, spectate this famous monument to mankind's hubris. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe consider that. Well, and the shell of that submersible is now resting uh, just a few yards from the Titanic. I think, you know, it's obviously clear all indications were of the number of problems with this submersible itself. It seems like the CEO who was lost in this uh, uh, submersible uh, issue uh, was pushing beyond a lot of the testing, a lot of these capabilities. Uh, and it's clear how the story was going to end, even from the reports just a few years ago. Yeah, he paid with his own life for this. I, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, it's why I, I just can't imagine. I mean, I guess that's the, you know, that's the attitude of a lot of people in the, you know, going back hundreds of years in the exploration category. Um, you know, people who wanted to circumnavigate the globe. You know, it takes courage and a, and a, we're just going to do this and we're going to do our best kind of attitude. And you know, you can't have safety checks and protocols for everything if you're going to innovate. That said, that seems very needless and like corners were cut and it resulted in people's deaths, including his own. So I have to imagine there's going to be just massive liability. Although I guess, you know, if, I don't know, if you decide, you know what, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to get into this thing. We're going down to the Titanic. Maybe you just agree to take on a certain amount of just insane risk to do it. And it's, it's so inherently unsafe. I don't know how you can Say like, I've oh, I didn't know it was going to possibly explode on me, even though it's I've you're going to, to the bottom of the of, ocean. A lot of forms signed before uh, yeah. stepping into that uh, vessel in terms of legal protections and stuff like that. But I, I think you have the weight of the ocean pressing on your submersible. Yeah. And I think this, uh, it, and it comes back to the hubris of the CEO uh, pushing the envelope when multiple people said uh, that the vehicle, the vessel, is not safe for this kind of transportation. I know a father and son were lost uh, mm -hmm. in that uh, wreck as well. A son who did and not it, want to go. Who did not want to go, and it really captured the attention of the nation for you know seven, eight hours when they were uh, looking for that. It was an all uh, hands on deck uh, operation to when people were pretending that. that it was still a yeah. possible rescue option, even though the second they stopped responding and there was no, 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 yeah. it was the pressure it alone was over. There's yeah. no, there was. No way you're going to be rescuing anyone. Now, they have obviously made successful dives down to the Titanic. Sure. It's been done. Um, James Cameron did it a number of times mm -hmm. as he was... Robert Ballard found it originally yeah. uh, through a lot of safety protocols and things like that more than a couple of decades yeah, ago. Yeah, it was only now, think, found uh, in the, the 70s, 70s, 80s? I think 80s or 90s, right, is when 90s? Ballard did well, it. Well, the movie uh, came out of the 90s. It had been yeah. found by then. I think it was, yeah, maybe it was the 80s, um, which is pretty remarkable, actually, to think that it was only within our lifetimes, although I guess the... 
the sinking was within yeah. some people's lifetimes, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and fueled that you know blockbuster movie too. Yeah. All right. Well, we will uh, continue to see if there are any additional updates on the Titanic story. But that does it for us today on Rising. Thanks so much for tuning in. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you never miss any of our content. And for those of you who like to listen while on the go, we're now available anywhere you can find podcasts. Uh, I'll be back here tomorrow, and you will as I'll be, well. I will sir. be as well. Yeah, Great. I'll see you tomorrow. The dream will live again tomorrow on Thursday. Please tune in then. See you later. <laughs>